Statistics and Excel, standard deviation of means estimate example. Get ready and some coffee because it's time to get realistic with statistics and Excel. Here we are in Excel. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the Matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey saying. So get one because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. If you don't have access to this workbook, that's okay because we'll basically build this from a blank worksheet. But if you do have access, there are three tabs down below. Example, practice blank. Example, in essence, the answer key. The practice tab having pre-formatted cells so you can practice the practice problem with less Excel formatting. The blank tab, the one we will be working in as you can see is blank so we will construct this from a blank sheet practicing our excel tools as we build it let's go to the example tab to get an idea of what we will be constructing looking at another example problem trying to give us an intuitive understanding of this formula this formula being the standard deviation of the x bars which looks somewhat intimidating, but remember from a prior presentation that we looked at that we can often drop down, drop off this last bit if we have a large enough relationship between the sample size represented here with the N, the little N, and the population represented here with the large N. So first, let's give a quick recap of why this is important. One reason it is important is because Oftentimes when we look at these formulas, they become somewhat arbitrary to us. And if we were to get a question such as, why are you applying the formula here? We would say something like, well, because that's, I went to step one, step two, and then I applied the formula and step three, and then it spits out the, the answer. And that would be like a calculator just doing the process, but not really understanding what, why the process is being done. And what we want to do is, is, not necessarily be able to prove this formula to understand all the math related to it and how it was constructed and so on and so forth, but to get an intuitive understanding of it so we know intuitively when it applies, why it applies, and then when we might have to change it in times when it doesn't apply. So let's give a quick recap of the story here. Oftentimes we're trying to say, I want to get information about a population we take a sample of that population, hoping to extract, extract information about the sample that we can apply to the larger population. It's often useful to start off by taking the entire population, which is known, then making sample information from that population to look at the relationship of the sample data to the population data, look at, uh, take those relationships and then apply them to scenarios where we don't know the entire population but only know uh, the sample. And by doing that, that's one way we can basically uh, intuit how this formula comes about. Now, you will also recall that we like that bell-shaped curve uh, because we know a lot about it. It's symmetrical and we can define the bell-shaped curve with just two numbers, that being the middle point, the mean or the average and the spread, that being the standard deviation. 
the population data itself, which we're going to represent with these numbers that we will construct, is not necessarily uh, in a bell-shaped curve. It might have, it might be somewhat bell-shaped data if we were to make a histogram from it, but it might not. It might be skewed to the left, skewed to the right, normally distributed. This will be more normally distributed because we're going to use a random generation to generate our population uh, data. Uh, however, if we take multiple samples and then we took the average of all the samples, then that data is going to be more likely to have a, a normal distribution. It's going to tend towards normal distribution. That's the concept of the uh, central limit theorem that we are going to be uh, working with. So in order to get that curve that we're looking for, we're looking at two numbers we need. We need the mean, which usually can be approximated by possibly even a sample. We can say how close do we think the sample is to the mean, or if we took the mean of all of the samples that we have, that's going to be tending towards that middle point, which seems to be intuitively correct to most people, I believe. What's a little bit more confusing is that number of the spread, that being the standard deviation. So we have to keep separate in our mind. We can take the standard deviation of the population, but that population data, although it still measures the spread, might not be in, in like that bell-shaped distribution. We could take the standard deviation of one sample, but that's not really what we're looking for here. We're looking for the standard deviation of the X bar, which we can imagine in a prior presentation, we mapped out all possible combinations of samples as though we had all the samples making up the entire population, right? That's kind of like the imaginary number that we're basically looking at. Here, we're going to take, uh, we're going to take multiple samples and take, a, take the average uh, of the multiple samples. Now, as we do this, we want to then look at the relationship of intuitively what's happening to the standard deviation if we take uh, the samples of 100, for example, versus uh, 10, for example, and we'll be able to actually calculate the, these numbers based on the samples that we have pulled together and compare that to what we can calculate with the formula. And, uh, and we'll see, get an intuitive understanding of that relationship so we can get an idea of, of kind of what this formula basically is doing, why it in essence works. All right, so let's go, if we go to the practice tab, this is going to have some pre-formatted cells so you can practice the practice problem with less Excel formatting. Let's go to the, the blank tab and just build this thing out. So I'm going to start off by just selecting the entire worksheet. I'm going to right click on it as we typically do. Format all of the cells. Go to currency, negative numbers bracketed. Get rid of the dollar sign. Remove the decimals to start off with. We will add them as needed, when needed. Closing that up, I like to go to the Home tab, Font Group, make the entire thing bold, which you might not need to do, but I think it's easier to see when recording. All right, I'm just going to put a header on here. This is going to be the STD uh, goes, I'm just going to say goes, let's say goes down by the square root. That's the formula for the square root of N, which is equal to sample size. Uh, or uh, which equals the sample size. So that's going to be basically the idea of our worksheet here. Let's make this larger. That's the relationship we want to get intuitively in our mind. Let's select these two. I'm going to make that a header, home tab, font group. I'm going to select the drop down, make that black and white. Okay, and then I'm just going to copy this formula over. I showed you before how we can construct uh, this formula, like you can, you can go to the insert tab, make the equation, and then actually ink it out and write the formula here. And uh, that's a great tool to, to be able to be aware of if you're trying to write down your formulas in Excel. Uh, uh, so they look kind of somewhat neat. <laughs> so then let's make our, our population. So we're going to imagine we're actually going to construct our population data. So I'm going to make a skinny B. And then we'll put it over here. I'm going to put a count column because I like to count the numbers that I'm going to, how many items we're going to have. And then this will be a pop. I'm just going to put POP for the population. Selecting the top two, I'm going to make this home tab, font group, black, white. And let's center it, alignment and center. Let's make this one, two, 
and then I'm going to count that down to 100. I'm going to make 100 of these. Actually, no, wait, let's go down. Let's go down way down to like 10,000. Let's do that a little bit more easily. I can do it this way, possibly saying equals sequence. And so we could count it down the way I was doing it, but let's try to do it this way. I'm going to say uh, that we want the rows. I want to make uh, 10,000 of them. 10,000 comma. Do I want columns? I just want one column and then comma. What's the starting point? I want it to be one at the starting point and then comma the number of steps with how many numbers in each step just one number whole numbers closing that up and enter and it spills it out so if i was to do it the other way i would say one two and then i could copy that down and it gives me that little fill handle but i got to go way down to ten thousand, which you could do see if i if i did it this way i could do it but it's somewhat tedious if I go control shift down over here, boom, there's the 10,000. All right, let's go control backspace and then I'm gonna control shift up and delete this stuff. All right, so there's our numbering. And then I'm just gonna make random numbers between one and 10, which is our population, which would be kind of like if we rolled a 10 sided dice or something, they're all gonna be having equally uh, likelihood of coming up, which we would think that would give us somewhat of a uniform distribution if we were to plot it with a histogram. How can I get those numbers? We're going to say this is going to be equal to, let's say, rand between, rand between. And I'm going to say it's between number one, comma, and number 10. Close that up and enter. So it gives me a random number, happened to be a one, and there happened to be a two, happened to be a three. This is a, there's another three, so was, there's a one. <laughs> All right. So then I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my cursor on that control. I'm just gonna double click on the fill handle and then say, put my cursor in here, control shift down to double check that it goes down 10,000 of them. There we go. Let's go all the way back up and let's select our columns. I'm gonna make them, I'm gonna double click to make them a little smaller and then I'll widen them out just a little bit. And then I'm gonna go in here and say control shift down again. And I like to make this home tab font group i'll put borders around it borders and then i usually go into the drop down i make it that blue if you don't have that blue it's in the more colors standard color wheel i make it that blue boom so there we have it let's make a histogram of it so i'm going to select my data control shift down and i'm going to say control backspace before i enter the histogram so it goes into the space i want it to be in and then go to the insert charts histogram and we'll just enter that histogram and let it do the buckets for us so it did our buckets down below so one to one two to two da, 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 ten to ten and you can see it's somewhat normally distributed which is what you would which is what you would expect so it's not doesn't have that bell-shaped curve looks like it's got that kind of normal distribution situation so how can we use the features of the bell-shaped curve then well, we can think about the mean of the means, because if we took multiple samples, it's going to tend towards uh, a bell shape. OK, so that's going to be the idea. So if I then say, all right, let's make this smaller and let's do our count here. I'm going to count it again. We already know that I put 10,000 there, but let's add the count just so we can see it equals count tab count all of these numbers. Control shift down, enter. So there's 10,000 of them. I'm gonna put the mean of the pop. So this is the pop mean equals the average. It's so just gonna take the average of all these numbers, control shift down, enter. And then let's take the, let's add some decimals. Gonna add some decimals. Doot, doot, doot. And then let's take the standard deviation. So this is gonna be the STD of the P or pop. So this equals the STD of the pop and we'll take that that's the measure of the spread so there so there we have it so no so you might say hey look i can make I can, i'm going to add some decimal i can make i can make basically a a bell curve but by, by, by this information because i have the mean and I have the standard deviation and i can use i can use my x my x's and and use my norm dot dist function 
to make a bell curve. And you could, but it's not going to it's not going to represent the data because the, this data, of course, uh, is not bell shaped. So it's not it's not <laughs> hovering around that middle point. So even though I have if it were bell shaped, I'd have this information, which would be enough to use the norm.dist function to make the approximation of the or the exact bell shaped curve. So, but it's not, but I can't do that here because again, the, the actual data isn't <laughs> bell shaped, it's uniform. So I'm going to go to the home tab, uh, number group, let's make uh, brackets around that and blue. All right, let's make it, let's make a skinny over here. So let's make this skinnier and I'll take that skinny con home font group and I'll make a skinny H. So what we're going to do is we're going to take samples. So I'm going to say count. And then I'm going to take samples of amounts of samples. N is going to be 100 in each sample. So we're going to take samples of this population and we'll take 100 of them each time. So I'm going to count this down. This time I'll just count it down because there's only 100 down to 100 instead of using the sequence. So there's that. I'm going to make that a black and white so there we have that one all right and then i'm going to say let's just say this will be s1 sample one and i'll make this black and white black white center so let's start with one sample so i'm going to pull i want to pull random numbers from here now there's a couple ways we can do this one way you can do it is you can put random numbers next to it in a table and randomly shuffle these numbers but another way that's more convenient right now is to use an index uh, function to do this. So the index function form format would look like this equals index. Then we'll pick up the index here and then it wants the array. We want to look up this array with the population data, put in my cursor here and then control shift down to go to the bottom, control backspace to get back up comma then we want the rows what do the rows mean i want you to look in here and give me random numbers from this data so i need to put a random i want random don't pick this random. this one random between make sure you pick the between and not the other one they sound similar i keep on clicking the wrong one and so then we want the bottom and the top of this one so we're looking at the bottom and the top now of uh this array and so I'm going to start on number one, which does not mean row one here. It means row one of the array that we're looking at, comma. And we want to go to the end of the array, which is 10,000. So the bottom of it is 10,000. And that should give us a random number from there and enter. Uh, it's going to close it up. Okay, there we have it. So this pulled in that six from there. I'm going to control shift. Wait a sec before I copy it down. I'm going to make this absolute F4 on the keyboard, make this absolute F4 on the keyboard and enter so that the index doesn't move down when I copy it down, then double click the fill handle copying it down. This is going to keep on shuffling. Everything's shuffling all over the place here, but that's okay. We'll let it shuffle. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. Now we have one sample. So if we had one sample, which might be the case that we'll talk about in like hypothesis testing later, but uh, we could say, okay, what's the mean of that sample? The mean of the sample is gonna be equal to the mean or the average tab of this, control shift down, those 100 numbers. And I'm gonna add some decimals. Now this isn't exactly this number, but if we only had one sample, Hopefully we can we can try to approximate how approximate how likely that would be basically in the center. We'll talk about that later. But conceptually, we're getting the idea that yeah, that would tend towards hopefully the middle of the population. Now the standard the st STD of the sample then is where it's a little bit more confusing. If I said I want this is going to be the STD of now this is the sample. This is measuring the spread of these numbers. Control Shift down and control backspace and enter so now we're going to add some decimals here you could say okay maybe that's approximating uh this standard deviation which is fine but what i'm what i would like to do is create something that's going to have that bell-shaped curve so i really want the standard deviation of the x bars of the means as though we took multiple different 
uh, multiple different samples, which we looked at last time by taking all possible combinations of samples and then looking at the standard deviation of the means. This time, we won't do all possible combinations, but we'll do uh, 10 of them. So now I'm going to say, okay, let's look at the next bit where I'm going to say this is going to be sample two, sample three, and then I'm going to select these and copy it out to like 10 of them. Sample two, three, four, five, six, and then do, do, let's keep on six. Do, do, do. There's out to 10. Let's select all of these, make them home tab, font group, header formatting, black and white, center them. I'm going to select all of these columns and make them around the same size. I've uncentered. I wanted to center these. I uncentered them, alignment and center. All right, so now I'm just going to copy this index uh, over this way. So that, do I need to do anything to it? No, it looks good. So I should be able to just copy this one across this way. Do, 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 do. And then I'm going to select these items and then just double click and copy it down. And then I'll say control shift down. Does it look like it did it? It did it correctly. So there's going to be all of our data. So let's take this information, control shift down, make that blue and bordered font group border blue. Let's make this border blue, border blue. Now I could go to the bottom here and calculate my mean or average, but I'd like to have it up top to where my data is. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, okay, let me see if I can pull my results. I'm gonna make a skinny by selecting this skinny home tab format painter. Let's make a skinny up top. And then let's say we're gonna say this is gonna be the means for if we had all 100 uh, of them. Right, and then so this is going to be for all 100, and this is, and then let's put it down here. This will be S. Well, this will equal. Let's do this S1, and then I'm going to copy that uh, over. Do, do. Let's do it. Th Actually, let's do it this way. Uh, let's put this. Let's put this up top here, and this down here. And then I'm going to say, okay, there's S1 and let's put the 100 right here, 100 samples. Sorry about this. I'm changing the format from my example a little bit here. So I'm going to then copy this across to do. So now we've got seven, uh, nine, 10 of them. Let's make these thinner. So I'll make these thinner selecting this and I'm going to say this is going to be home tab font group uh, black and white and center. Now the reason I did that in our example over here, I put them vertically, which I like, but I can't easily copy the data over. I had to go in each of these and then average them up one at a time instead of copying the formula, which would be easier to do if I had if I set my table up this way. So just to note on table building uh, what my thought process is there. So this is the mean uh, of, so, so these are the means of the samples equals, this is going to be the average, average, if I got the right formula there, that's correct, of the first sample, control shift down, and then control backspace, there it is, and enter. I can add some decimals duh, duh, and then maybe I need to make this a little larger again. I'm going to make all these a little larger uh, and then I'll copy it. Now I can copy this across. That's the beauty of it. So the average I can copy across and it'll take this last one is taking the sample or the average of all those. And so that looks correct. Okay. And so then I can say, all right, now I want to take the mean of the means, which is going to be X bar mean of means. And maybe I should pull this down. I'll pull all of this down because that header is too long. And then I'll say this is going to be X bar mean of means. And then I'm going to select this and delete that so that it's not too wide. And then 
home tab, font group, brackets, this one, and white, and then make this a little bit larger. So now I'm going to take the mean of all the means of all the samples, right? So now I'm going to say this equals the average, which is the mean of these, and enter. Let's make this black and white. Do, do. Now notice you might not always have that in practice. We'll talk about where we take a sample uh, later and, and you might take multiple samples and so on and get more data and so on and so forth where you can take the mean of the means. But conceptually, the idea, the idea here is we're looking for basically uh, that X bar, right? The mean of uh, the means. And this should, all of these means of each sample should be close hopefully to the actual mean but it would make sense that the mean of all the means is possibly going to even be more close to the actual population mean which i think makes intuitive sense it's the standard deviation that sometimes is a little bit uh confusing so let's now take then the standard deviation this is going to be the std of the sample means so I'll put that over here at the end. So this is going to be equal to STD, now this time of the samples. And I'm picking up because this isn't the entire population of these items. So we're going to say boom. And then that's going to give us, if I add some decimals, boom, boom, boom. And of course, that is a lot smaller than the standard deviation of uh, the population that we've that we've uh, made here but if i if i map out the x bars instead of having a uniform distribution it's it's going to have that bell-shaped kind of distribution so that's why we're looking for uh the standard deviation of the x bars now again we might not have all of this information we might only have like one sample which is why we end up using this formula possibly to calculate what the standard deviation would be so let's instead of looking at it this way where we have multiple items let's think about if we just did it with the formula so first let's think about this is going to be the mean of the population i'm just going to pull these numbers over this equals the mean of the population that we had over here which was this and so we have that number let's actually maybe i'll put this over here here's the mean of the population I'll, I'll keep it there and then the the this equals the std standard deviation of the population so this is the mean of the pop and this is the standard deviation of the pop do, 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 just so we have those numbers over here so there are those add in some decimals so 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 the difference of the mean so mean difference i'm going to say is equal to th this mean of the population minus the means of the x bars and you can see it, of course, is quite close, which is basically what we would expect. Let's put this one. Let's put this over here so it's larger, and I don't have to widen the cell. So you would expect that to be pretty close. Sometimes it's negative, and sometimes it's positive. I think that makes basically intuitive sense that if we take the mean of all of the samples, that we're going to get a number that's possibly closer to that uh, center point. So now let's take a look at the an, an estimate of the STD, the STD sample means uh, estimate. And we could also call this the uh, X bar and possibly, uh, so I'll say equals or standard error. So these are terms that you might see uh, for this one where we have to think and keep it separate in our mind from the standard deviation of the population 
the standard deviation of one sample, this being the approximation of the standard devi deviation of uh, the X bars. So it's gonna be this formula over here, and I'm just gonna use this first half of it, which is taking the standard deviation of the population, which in this case is known to us. In later cases, we might not know that, and we'll adjust it. And then I'm gonna not do the second bit here because we talked about that last time. I'm just gonna divide by the square root of N, which is the number uh, of, of the samples. So we're gonna say then the sample size. So this is going to be equal to, this is gonna be equal to the uh, standard deviation of the population divided by, and then the square root formula is SQ square root in Excel, the square root of the sample size, which let's pull it over here. We said, uh, I didn't put a count. Well, I'll just hard code it. It was 100. Each of them had 100 that we pulled in. And so there it is. Let's add some decimals. Dirt, dirt, dirt. Okay. And then we can look at the difference between what we calculated when, when, we, when we did the standard deviation of 10 samples versus imagining maybe we only had one sample and then we use the formula to do the calculation, right? So now we have the standard deviation that we calculated up top, to minus this one. And I'm not gonna uh, mess with the correction factor right here, but just to know, just to note intuitively, we're pretty close. So the formula is uh, pretty close. And it's not, this isn't exact as exact a calculation we did before when we looked at all possible combinations that we looked at before, where you might get an answer that you would expect to be more exact like we looked at last time. But this is just again to kind of illustrate this concept of the standard deviation with the formula that we're going to be approximating kind of the idea that we had all of the all of uh, the the means of all the samples, all the different combinations. So let's format this. I'm going to say this is going to be uh, border blue. And let's make these do, 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 same here and same here. Probably could have formatted this a little bit better, but we'll put this here do, 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 and then here. So we'll say do. And then let's do the same thing, but this time we're going to estimate uh, the means. We'll take the means as though we only had 10 instead of uh, 100, and we'll make our estimate there. Again, I'm not going to deal with the correction factor of it uh which could make it we'll we'll take a look at it so let's copy this whole format down let's copy this down here and i'll paste it here so i'm going to say do, do it paste it and then i'm just going to delete the numbers and we'll do a recalculation of them and so this is going to be the same this will equal the same numbers up top equal this one because that's the actual population and this equals the same number here. Dirt, dirt. I'll keep those numbers, but I'll delete these numbers. And then I'm going to make this out of 10 this time. So, so now I'm going to say this equals the same samples one, sample one to sample, uh, sample 10. But instead of taking the entire thing, this time we're just going to take the first 10. So we have an N of 10, the sample size of 10. So I'll show you how to do that. We're going to say this is going to be equal to the average. And then instead of taking all 100 numbers, I'm just going to say this down to 10. So we're just taking 10 instead of an N of 100, N of 10. So we'll say enter. And so then I'm going to copy that across. Do, 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 do. And there we have that. And once again, we take our mean of the means equals the mean or the average, average tab. And so we should get something still close to our population uh, mean. We would think even though we reduced the size of the samples uh, uh, from having 100 in them to 10. And then I can calculate the, uh, what was this? standard deviation of the means equals the STD 
this is going to be of s of these items and so we we get this number here and now let's calculate uh, the difference so this is the difference on the means so the difference of the means which I think somewhat still kind of makes intuitive sense that we're still going to hopefully be approximating that mid middle point, but possibly not as exact, given the fact that the sample sizes are 10 rather than 100, even though we took 10 of them. And then we've got the standard uh, deviation here. We're going to use our formula. This time it's going to be the standard deviation of the population. Uh, this one divided by the square root sq square root of and this time it's just going to be the 10 i should pick that one up so the 10 that's going to be our uh n the square root of n and so our formula and then the difference this is what we calculated up top and here's what we get here so this is hopefully giving us an idea that uh, that even if we only had one sample we could still get this calculation x bar the standard deviation as though we took all possible examples giving us an intuitive sense of how that formula basically is working so that we can then use that to approximate a bell-shaped distribution with just those two numbers now the mean and then the standard and then the standard uh, deviation okay let's just go ahead and approximate that and say okay how would we make that bell-shaped curve based on this information well we can let's go back up top and i'm going to make this i'll make a skinny over here and then i'm going to say this is going to be my my lower x to the upper x and i'm going to make standard deviation the spread as st std spread is going to be four standard deviations so i can get all of my information in there so what's the lower x going to be when we graph this thing? It's going to be the middle point, which is the mean, which I could get from here. But I want to choose a number that's not going to be changing all the time. So I'm going to use the pop mean, which is pretty close to the mean that we've got in uh, here. And then I'm going to subtract from that the standard deviation, which we calculated here. But I'm going to use this calculation because once again, it's going to be static. So I'll pick that one, meaning it's not going to be changing all the times as we update the sheet. And then I'm going to say times four standard deviations so the middle point minus four standard deviations adding some decimals goes down to 4.344 about and then how high are we going to go it's going to be equal to the middle point which once again i'm going to take this mean here and then i'm going to add the standard deviations which i'm going to take for this one times four standard uh, deviations up which should be about all of our data adding some decimals all right so let's go over here i'm going to take the skinny on this side format paint it and i'm just going to make our graph by choosing my x and this is going to be my p of x the probability of x do, do. and then i'm going to keep on practicing graphing this so i can get a visual representation so we have this we're going to center it and here we have it all right, so the, the low point I'm going to say is I need to go from around four up to like seven. So let's let's just say it's going to be, let's start at four here just to approximate it. Let's add some decimals and I'm going to go in uh, steps of 4.01. So that's going to be my next step and I want to go up to seven. So I could use a sequence to do that formula, but this doesn't go too far. So I'm just going to select those two, use my format painter or my uh, fill handle to drag it down until I get to seven. So I'm going to go up to seven. Do, 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 do. Probably should have used the sequence thing because it is a little bit of a ways down here to get to around seven. So there we have it. Just go. Duh. All right. And then I'm going to go back up top. So we'll say done. And then let's go ahead and do our formula, which is our norm.dist equals norm.dist tab for each of these X's. So I'm going to select that X and then comma. I'm looking for the mean. I'm going to pick the static mean over here. So the one that's not changing, which is the population mean, which is close to the mean that we calculated there. 
F4 on the keyboard to make it absolute comma standard deviation. Now I'm not looking the pop population standard deviation. I'm not looking at the standard deviation for one sample. I'm looking for the standard deviation that we estimated, which we did this way. And then we also estimated it with the formula. I want to use the formula because that's what we're going to use in practice uh, later. And because it's static, meaning it's not going to change F4. And so then I'm going to say comma, and I don't want it to be cumulative, therefore a zero instead of a one and close it up. All right, I should be able to then format that number group, percentify it, adding some decimals. I'm going to copy it down. Now note that the sum comes out to, uh, what is that, 100,000 if I add it up, and you would think it would be like 100. So, and that's because the, the units that we have here, and I'd like to make it around 100. So I'm going to kind of cheat here to do it. I'm going to double click here. I'm going to go to the end of it and divide it by 100 and then go back on it and click that down so that I have my percentages that add up to 100. It's, you, you may or may not need to do that. And notice the idea here is I just want to get a picture of it. I want to actually see the bell curve and I'm most concerned with you know, the X axis to see how much of how much of the area falls under a certain point when I'm trying to visualize the thing pictorially. And personally, for me, I was never really good at drawing the pictures by hand on paper. So being able to graph these things out uh, in Excel helps me just to visualize it. So that's going to be the idea. So I'm going to then make this smaller and then you can make multiple graphs from this. I'm going to say control shift down, control backspace, and then we can go into the insert. Now you could use the good old bar graph, insert a bar graph, and you get something that looks like that, which has that bell shape to it. Sometimes that's a nice, easy graph uh, to use, but you always need to then adjust the X's down below. So I'm gonna go then to the X, to the data, and then edit uh, this side. And I want to make my X's start from here down to here, control shift backspace. Sometimes it doesn't show up unless you hit this little thing. And then when I see it show up over here, I'm going to say, there it is. And then okay. And okay. So remember our, our goal is that we want to basically look at where these endpoints are because we're often going to be measuring to see how much of it kind of rule settles in the middle of the graph, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but, you can also do it with a line graph. You can say control shift down, control backspace, insert a line graph looking like that. Sometimes that's an, an easier way to see it. And sometimes you can graph on top and you would do the same, you know, put another graph on top of it if you needed to or something like that. You still need to change the X's. So I'm going to select here, edit, and then we will change the X's, control shift down, control backspace, select this and this, and then okay. And so there we have it, boom. And then of course we have the, the one, the one uh, that we, when we want the most detail, which is the area graph. So you can, you can use any of these to kind of make a simple picture of what you're trying to do. Let's do the area graph now. So I'm gonna say control shift down, control backspace and then insert and then hit this item to see more we're going to say all and i want to choose the area graph this time boom deleting the title on that one and let's make this one i'm going to scroll out a little bit let's make it a little smaller on this one oh hold on and so I'll make this a little bit smaller here. And then once again, we need to add our X. So I can then say, okay, let's go to the design data and then add the X to here. Control shift. Oh, hold on a second. I totally messed it up. I messed up the whole thing. Cancel. Do it again. Do it again. You messed it up here. And then we're going to say, we want from four down, control shift backspace. I'm gonna click on this and then again until it populates. And so there we have it. Now we also might end up wanting, you know, the Z scores, which we'll talk about later. So I could say uh, the Z and then I'm gonna say duh, duh, 
Let's pick up the Z going to and the Z is going to be equal to these are the in standard deviations, the X uh, minus the X bar, which I'm going to be uh, the, the, the pop. I'm going to use the pop mean because it's not going to change. And then I'm going to say F4 on the keyboard and then close it up and divided by the standard deviation, which I'm going to use the standard deviation that we calculated here because it's not going to change as I adjust it and then F4 and then close that up. And uh, hold on, something went horribly, horribly wrong there. So this minus that, div this should be closed up and then divided by this one du, 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 du. and then f4 okay and then enter and we could add some decimals copy that down so now we have it in uh standard uh deviation or uh terms the z scores and then i might want to graph the z scores with a second graph to do that I'm going to need I'm going to need to plot another data so I'm going to make this one be equal to this will be uh when z I'm going to say this thing so I can type in here uh the z needs to be uh ne let's say negative 2 z needs to be greater than that and ne z needs to be less than positive 2 that's what I'm going to graph here format that over here. So I'm going to use the function to do this. We'll do this multiple times, but just to get an idea of it, we're going to say this is going to be equal to uh, if logic test tab, and then we have two logic tests. So I'm going to embed an and in here tab, and I'm going to say if uh, this number is greater than uh, negative two and then next logic test comma this number is less than positive two close up the and those are my two logic tests then a comma what do we want to do if that's the case then we want you to give us the percentage item and then comma what about if it's not I want you to just leave it blank I'm going to put brackets like that and so that's a space so it gives us a space. If I double click it down, then I can see, okay, is it populating in the middle here? Something something went wrong. Oh no, it has it here. So it's populating it. So that looks good. Let's say control shift down. Let's percentify it, add some decimals so I can see it. So if I go down here, there's our numbers. So I'm gonna add that to our graph. This is our more detailed chart here. So now I'm going to say, uh, let's go to the design data. And let's say that we're going to add data. And this is going to be then this will be the name of it. And this is going to be the series I want to add here down to here, control shift, control backspace. And then I'm going to click on this and off again until it adds it. So that's the orange bit. So I'm going to say, okay, and then okay. And then I now I would like to double click on that orange bit and add the secondary axis because I want the axis down here giving me the Z's as well. So I want a secondary axis. Okay, now I need to add the secondary axis go into the data again. And then I'm going to go to the second one, edit it, and then add the secondary axis, which will be the Z's. Control shift down, control backspace. I'm gonna click on this button and then again until I see it populate. It doesn't quite show up yet. So I'm gonna close this until I hit the plus button and then go to the, to the axis. And I want the secondary horizontal axis. So there it is. So that looks good. And then I'm going to, this one I over here, I don't want this one. I'll delete that and that should fix it. And then I want to pull this one to the bottom. So I'm going to hit the plus again, my axis and more options and then labels. And then 
and I want to make sure I'm on this one, I want to pull it to the low, to the bottom. Okay, and there we have it. All right, so I'm going to pull these down a bit. So now we have a, you know, a fancy graph that we can use to kind of visualize. And we have our axis over here in terms of the X. And then the Z with that middle point should be in the zero. And then, of course, you might want to add a nice little line here that will be your our tool to kind of think about, okay, where are we at on this chart? So to me, these charts are tedious to kind of build on this one. You might not need this complex chart. You might use this one with just a little line on it to graph. But to be able to graph something, to visualize it uh, is, is useful, especially when you're not really good at drawing it by hand on, on the paper and pencil. And what we're really looking for is we're assuming, obviously, this thing has 100% under the bell curve. And we're trying to think about where we lie on uh on the x-axis and so on and so forth and we'll take a look at more examples of that when we do our hypothesis testing uh in future presentations but we often use that two standard deviations to get an idea of the most of the information right is kind of in between the 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 two standard deviations and so on as a general rule so i'm going to go ahead and select all this Control shift down let's make this blue and uh, bordered. And then I'm gonna go over here and say, J -j 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 -j. let's make this blue and bordered, border blue, border blue. So the general idea here, our, our original data wasn't normally distributed. And we took our sample, we took multiple samples here, but if we only had one sample, what we want to be able to know is the middle point, which we can approximate with one sample, but also the standard deviation as though we took all possible samples in essence, because that's the thing using the central limit theorem, which is gonna give us a distribution that should tend towards the bell shape, which is what we're trying to get. And therefore, if we didn't take multiple samples, we can use this formula and get that standard deviation, which is the second component, only needing those two numbers to then plot our actual kind of bell-shaped curve, which can give us, you know, that more predictive capacity, which we can then graph over here once we have those two numbers.